Yeah. And I'm still waiting for you on Instagram as well, if you just confirm quickly. No, I have. Cool. Hey. Perfect. Cool. We're ready to roll. Okay. Let me just turn you down. All right. Ready to roll? Yeah, man. Okay. Um, um, so hello to everyone who is joining um, for another episode of Wine and Viticulture um, Education. Um, this is a show with me and Dylan, uh, where we like try and delve into some subjects in wine and viticulture that are, are of interest to other people. Um, but my name is Gus Gluck, and I'm a London-based wine bar founder and professional taster. And I am Dylan Grigg, Australian viticulturalist, and you may know me by my Insta handle, cryptically G Diller. Uh, we've started this little channel to share our passion um, and our objective in this series is to bridge the world of wine consumption with its roots in growing grapes. Topics will be wide ranging and most likely quite nerdy as there is no set script. You, the audience, are encouraged to throw ideas and opinions into the mix as we tease out and chew the fat on some trendy and not so trendy topics. As a disclaimer, this is not a science. This is not scientific, but is instead an insight into what a sommelier and a viticulturist would and should talk about over a beer. Well, today hey, we're I'll discussing. I'll add a uh, a, vitic a viticulturist with a PhD, so there'll be a little bit of science blended in there. there. Exactly, Doctor Doctor Dylan. <laughs> exactly, but uh, that being one of my strengths is having a PhD on one hand and dirt under my nails on the other hand, having worked my way up from uh, driving tractors and doing the work. Which is the most important thing. Um, but um, anyway, so let's get into it. Um, so rootstocks and grafting, um, well, what it. are they? What are they? Well, we've got you over here on Insta and we've got you up here over on YouTube Live. I can't turn my sound off on the old Insta one, so I've stuffed it full of blue tack. So hopefully you guys <laughs> <laughs> can't hear it. Uh, I guess grafting is is grafting and rootstocks are one of the uh, perhaps not the most trendy things to talk about, but it's a it's a big topic that we all deal with in viticulture and in the wine world. Yeah. So you know you know Gus why all of well the majority of Europe is on rootstocks. Yeah. Um, so that's because of phylloxera. Indeed. So in the 18, well, Vitis vinifera was grown in Europe for, uh, well, for centuries, basically. But then in the 18, mid 1800s from America, from the US, some vines started to come over. And with those came a root louse, which is phylloxera. So the vines started to die. And this basically spread out from uh, the south of France, from Montpellier. The vines were dying yeah. and it took some time to figure out what exactly it was. And it turned out that it was this louse from the US. And what, what was one method that they could use to grow the varieties that they wanted to keep producing, like the Syrahs, Pinots, Chardonnays? Because these, got, these varieties kept having their roots eaten. So yeah. they weren't growing. Whereas American vines that were in Europe that tasted foxy, that weren't weren't favoured, yeah. were still growing. So the idea went, hang on, if this louse came from America and it's attacking our, or it's attacking the Vitis vinifera European vines, what if we put American roots on the bottom and a European vine, our noble varieties, on top? So we get- It's pretty amazing, good, really. Like the whole mental process of processing that back then is still kind of kind of phenomenal in a weird way no totally i mean they um there was a massive pushback because the american varieties had that um you know that typically foxy flavor like um yeah strawberry wine like super sweet aromatic. yeah super sweet yeah so there was a real no structure there, 
yeah, so there was a real pushback and um, the, uh, the Europeans, the French specifically, did not want that flavour in their wines. So they're mentally going, well, as a direct producer, we can't just plant American vines because it's not Pinot Noir, it's not Syrah, it's, it's completely different. And then this whole reconstitution of American roots with a European vine on top, there was a fear that the flavour would come through. And like you said, it's pretty crazy, the Franken vine, how, yeah. could, how could they grow? How could you do that to the noble varieties of Europe in the home of viticulture? But anyway, getting, getting over that into the um, 1870s, 1880s, grafting became accepted and these American varieties were, were used as rootstock, so as the roots, to put their European vines on top. So, oh, wow. If, do you have some pictures? I've got a picture. Have you got that, Gus? Yeah. So you can see this here? Let's have a look. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so what is going on here? So what's going on here? I can't get a good zoom. Hopefully that zoom is good enough for you. If you can see my cursor on see top, cursor sorry, on in Instagram sorry. land. There's a link. There's a link up in Gus's uh, bio that you can. Don't worry, and I've got it live. Oh, sweet. Yeah, but it's pretty blurry from my end. Anyway. Yeah. This is a grafted vine. So up the top here, near the sky, you can see this is actually Petit Verdot, and then you see this massive roots here. This is the graft union. So above the union, we call the scion, and below the union is the rootstock. So wow. when we're talking about we're rootstocks, talking about we're rootstocks, talking about we're generally talking the part generally below, the ground. below ground. Yeah. Okay. And what looks weird looks about amazing. this us? Well, well, there's shoots. Well, it looks like dried shoots that are coming out yet from where it's been fused. Exactly. So this vine was planted a little bit too deep. So what you can see is you can see that the vinifera roots, so the scion has actually rooted into the soil above wow. the graft union. Maybe the graft union didn't connect properly or the vine just saw it as a restriction. So when it was going to put roots out in autumn or in spring, instead of going through that graft union and down into the, um, I think this is uh, SO4, it's yeah. Not, I'm going to shortcut that and went straight into the soil. Now, wow. the rootstock is it's wild, alive, but you can see the root structure is totally different. Yeah. Like, and is this common? Uh, it's, it's more common than it should be. Usually when you are grafting, you graft well above ground, so you don't have this phenomenon. And the graft, the rootstock is generally very well disbudded so that it doesn't shoot. But I don't know, there's a trend at the moment to, well, there's a, there's a push and for valid reasons to graft in the field, which some people do it underground, which aids in okay. the, the fixing of the graft. But yeah. for me, I would, ex, I would exercise caution. Well, we don't need that. I would exercise caution because you don't want to have that graft, that scion take root. Um, also, um, and Amber, um, and Amber was just uh, uh, wondering what is the compound in in American rootstock that makes it impervious to phylloxera, or do you know what the compound is? Or, um, hang on. Hey, Damon. Hey, uh, I just got a I just got an Insta that the YouTube's not working. Let's have a look. Is yours live? It well, is live. Uh, okay, cool. Well, the the thing is, is the, the vitis vinifera, the phylloxera can feed all over the roots. And then the roots create these galls because they're trying to repair. So they just pump extra starch into the, into the roots. And it makes the vine essentially tired because it's just expending all of this energy, just trying to regrow roots and just trying to reheal. And secondary pathogens then can also enter the roots and kill the vine. So this okay. vine is bam, 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 bam. Whereas um, when you get tolerant rootstocks, because let's make a point here that there's rootstocks that are resistant, then there's rootstocks yes. that are tolerant. Yeah. Now, the majority of rootstocks tolerate 
phylloxera feeding. They're not resistant, but the, they don't allow the phylloxera to feed on the bulk of the roots. It feeds on the tips. Yeah. And the tips the roots are constantly replenished all the time. Roots are growing, dying, growing, dying. So the vine can just grow new tips and it doesn't yeah. become a major drain in most circumstances. Yeah. So it's a bit like those those feet um those fish that um that eat the dry skin off your feet yeah i don't know that it's that relaxing for a vine but yeah you're right <laughs> um so um like so should we kind of go through a little bit of the process of actually grafting yeah good point so we've got the definition down of the rootstock and the sign and i'm just trying to get you uh back here Close. Okay. Um, what have we got? So I'm just trying to uh, organize my bits and pieces so that you can see that next. Oh, we, sorry, at home, we're not um, known for our technical prowess. No. We're actually not known for much, really. Not even our drinking prowess. Well, except for... There you are. Except Hello. There we go, we're back. Yeah. Screen sharing has stopped. Okay. This um, process of grafting. So the process, so the process of grafting. Back in when when phylloxera first entered into Europe, they had to figure out a way to graft these American vines onto the onto the European vines. So the first way was with a knife. Make two cuts and make a complementary cut in the rootstock and in the sign and join them so that that cambium can fuse and that can be one vine. Yeah. yeah, something like that. Um, but that's very slow. So that would require people going out into the field and cutting and inserting buds in every single vine. Yeah. And the sheer number of vines that needed to be grafted or replaced in Europe at this time, I think it was in um, uh, the George Gale, in the Gales book, said it would stretch around the earth. Wow. Oh my like God. Millions and millions of vines. So naturally, um, machines were invented. So there was a machine invented with, uh, which would make complementary cuts. This is in the 18, 1880s, make complementary cuts so that the vines would stick together quite quickly. Yeah. Then once the vines were together, they're put in an environment where that wound is allowed to callus and heal usually grown out in a nursery and then planted a year later. So it's amazing. quite a uh, quite a laborious process. Hence the cost of grafted vines can often be substantially more than simply taking a cutting, rooting it and planting it. Yeah, wow. So um, that kind of like mechanized way of grafting then, so your long-term has, has that shown to be a really effective way of grafting or um like has it kind of damaged the plants in that mechanized way or i think um i think this off oh, this kind of touches on my insta post from earlier today but i think the earliest graphs were done by hand right and then these machines were invented the first one was like the rotating blade that made these vertical cuts yeah and that and there was a lot of material planted like that but it wasn't until um the mid to late 70s that there was another method of mechanization which uses that keyway, the omega shape, which yeah. this prevented this prevented the rootstock from pushing the sign off and meant that you could click it together and everything was much more efficient in the nursery. Yes, but, this is the omega shape, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's so there's a there are millions of vines that are grafted in a nursery um, with the Omega saw or with the Omega tool. You can even buy them by hand and in your backyard, oh, okay. you know, you can make a cut this way and then turn around, cut that way and join them together. It's pretty simple. And it meant that throughput could go through the roof. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. So it's, um, it's very, very quick. Um, so, yeah, so then should we maybe start discussing some other reasons why you would graft? Yeah, we can do. I um, guess if we, I guess if we go back to where the, I touched on where the um, American vines came from. So, yeah, 
if we talk about vitis is the genus and vinifera is the species. So we've got vitis vinifera, which is our, yeah, our, taste, our okay. noble varieties, yeah. Chardonnay, Pinot that I keep mentioning. But then you've got vitis riparia, vitis rupestris, um, Berlandieri. So if we look at the major, the major group of rootstocks come from riparia, which yeah. riparia likes fertile soils and is a low vigor rootstock. So it confers that to what it's, what's grafted on top. Whereas say rapestris is more drought tolerant, but it doesn't like chalk, but it's got good vigor. So originally we started using just these single, these single species. So riparia on with, you know, a Grenache on top or rapestris with a Grenache on top. But then it came to this issue that I talked about at the very start about why these vines, the pure American vines were dying. And in Europe, it became apparent that was because of the free calcium. So the high lime content, free lime in the soils. Yeah. So back on the boat, back to the US, down to um, some chalky, chalky cliffs in Texas, to search for American vines that can grow with a lot of uh, free lime. And they found Vitis berlandieri. So then you've got uh, oh Riparia and Rapestris, which are your main varieties or your main species. These are often crossed, but then if you cross berlandieri, which can handle lime, you've got drought tolerance and lime tolerance. Okay. So you follow. Yeah. Wait, so, and just for people, so what's important, what's the importance of being uh, lime tolerant for a vine? In Europe, where you've got, a, where you've got a lot of limestone, you can have a lot of free calcium and where you've got a lot of free calcium, the effect of the calcium and the pH in the soil, it makes iron uh, unavailable to the plant. So you get this iron uh, okay. porosis, so really yellow, crappy leaves and the vines basically they can kill the vine. Up. It yeah, can. Can kill, yeah. Um, and you can add like iron supplement to soil, can't you? But it's not. Well, I think it'd be like, it's that sort of thing is like turning around the Titanic, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, <laughs> Push it in one direction, but you probably hit another iceberg. Um, no, um, it, that's where rootstocks are um, an excellent tool in an excellent viticultural tool to modify the growing environment. So in Europe, a big driver is, um, is the free lime content of the soil. Yeah. Or you would put, say, um, rapestrous rootstocks where it's very, um, very dry. Um, and if anyone who's watching, by the way, um, it is quite important chat for UK based viticulture because um, there's a lot of like free lime and lots of soils here. So um, if you ever read uh, Stephen Skelton's got a great book actually on uh, like viticulture and rootstocks of the UK, um, because there's not much body of work done on like UK based viticulture, but he's done everything. So if anyone does want to read more, more about it, Stephen's book is the best. Um, also quickly, and Jakob had a quick uh, question which is what is your opinion opinion about the increase of esca on these omega grafted vines well, that's a good question but, uh, I guess the I think there's some research that's ongoing but I think what it comes down to is the continuity of the sap through the vine so whilst a vine with an omega graph might work really well in a nursery sense for throughput and to get things out. Um, like I hinted at in my Insta post, it's actually, it's pretty, um, well, it's non organic that shape. So you've got a, you've got a keyway kind of shape, which you've got these two, two bridges of vascular tubes that aren't connected to anything. And you're asking the plant to join bottom to top. So, Wow. I think some of the research talks about um, the pathogens like esca um, being attacking dead wood. And if you have a poorly formed graft of any type, if there's some dead wood inside that has those pathogens in there, then they can proliferate and kill the vine. Okay, so it's not exclusive for like, or it doesn't impact like omega vines more. I think the research is inconclusive. My feeling okay. is it does it does impact them more, okay. which is why I've got a greater interest in field grafting or chip or chip budding. But um, 
I think there's still research ongoing, but there's definitely some places have moved away. And I know Jakob is, he's, Jakob's been talking about that with me in moving away from an Omega to just a V machine grafting. Um, also, so then Jakob did just say, so um, so you would agree that Esker grafted vines pose a threat to the sustainability and longevity of vines and viticulture worldwide? Oh yeah, massively, yeah. Um, but um, so should we get back onto um, rootstock? So what about like drought resistance? So let me just close this, stop share. So yeah, so that's that's one thing where if you, are going to plant vines in an area that doesn't have a lot of rainfall, it's best to choose a rootstock, which there are many options that can have a better resistance against drought. So yeah. remember last week we talked about the pessimists and the optimists? Yeah. The Syrah and the Grenache? Yeah. So the isohydric vines are the pessimists. So the stomatas close early and they, um, they really look after their water, which is the Grenache. And yeah. the anisohydrics would be the optimists and they'd be like, ah, we'll be all right, don't worry about it. But they end up falling over. So if you talk about rootstocks and rootstock selection is important because your anisohydrics might be a 101.14, for example, which is a Riparia repestris. Yeah. It isn't so good at um, if there's a dry period. So if you miss an irrigation schedule or you've got a dry end of the season, they're just not going to finish, which if you want vine stress late in the season and you want a vine to race up with its color and alcoholic degree or sugar, maybe it's a good thing. But if you want the pessimist, like the Grenache of the rootstock, then you'd be going more for a repestris. Uh, okay. Like um, Victor 10 or 99 Victor or something like that. Um, wait, so also, and Amber just had a, a question, which was how many rootstocks are there to choose for? Oh, graphic. that's a good question. So this, <laughs> there are, what are there? I don't even know how many in total. There's around 30 that are used around the world. Yeah. Of them, there's about maybe 10 or 20 that are the top, like the most popular ones. And if you go down from a global perspective to a country perspective to a regional perspective, maybe there's only four or five rootstocks okay. that, are proven and work in a specific environment. So when we talk about um, the genetic bottleneck of the genetic bottleneck of the varieties we're dealing with, you know, like the top seven, Cab Sav, Merlot, yep. Syrah, when it comes to rootstocks, it's even worse. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah, 30. That's pretty amazing. Um, and they're not they're also, not sexy to talk about and they're underground, so they're difficult to study. Yeah. So once once the problem was solved with lime, kind of shelved. Once the once the drought resistance was kind of was uh, identified and nematode resistance shelved. So what about Jacob's kind of um, your body of work and research? Like, does that help understand them more? Which doesn't he what use? Do you um, he doesn't he use um, like thermal um, like thermal cameras and stuff to your map root networks and stuff. Or, or like, yeah. I don't quite follow what you're talking oh, about. Oh, no, like, no, like, is it, because it's only 30 varieties of rootstocks. Um, yeah. Like, um, like. Ah, the penny's dropped. Gus, yeah, you're talking about, you mean when you're setting up a vineyard, you yeah, mean yeah. soil mapping and using. Yeah, soil mapping. DIS exactly. and electromagnetic and soil pits to make exactly. sure that yeah. you're matching your soil with your rootstock. Yes. So, yes. So Absolutely. those tools are now fundamental. Yes, because you you only get one shot at it. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a bit about drought resistance. So what, so what about vigor? So do they add or lessen vigor for a vine? They can alter the vigor of the scion um, significantly. Okay. So if you choose the wrong rootstock, the wrong rootstock, well, the scion's, more or less a given. If you're in one region, you're going to grow, you want to, going to want to grow Pinot, for example, or Shiraz. But mm. if you put the wrong rootstock on it, you can either have an excess of vigor or you can have a major lack of vigor. Uh, okay. 
So, and I mean, there's 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 studies. There's one that came out of the lab where I um where I did my PhD, where they studied rootstocks in the Barossa Valley, and they had, you know, they had the top six. All these ones that I talked about: um, one ten Richter, ninety nine, one forty Regeri, like all of these, you know, crazy codes. Yeah, and they had own rooted, and putting them next to each other and not irrigating the own rooted didn't perform as well as the rootstock. Why? So if you don't have a lot of water, it's best to have a rootstock. So there okay. can be implications for own rooted yeah. versus rootstock or your type or choice of rootstock. Because rootstocks can also change the, the length of the season and they can deal with nematodes. Um, also, and Yak, I kind of want to talk um, you, can you talk a little bit more about rootstock and see on uh, like affinity, like especially in Pinot Noir? What I can do is, if you just bear with me, talk amongst yourselves. I'll try and grab another. Talk picture. amongst yourselves. Yeah, oh, that's I right. We're just we're here to, we're here to it, see me. Well, it's just me and you. So, well, and other people and everyone else. More or less. I'm going to try and load up this. Can you see this? Yeah, uh, you got to click onto it though. You got a PDF on your screen? Uh, let's have a look. No. It says I'm sharing. No, you got to click onto that PDF though. You yeah, have. Anyway, what I'll do is after this, I will. Where are we? share this how's that yeah perfect okay so Jacob check this out this is tomography so this is normally used like a CT scan when you're really sick but these guys have looked inside a grapevine trunk that's 14 years old oh wow so in here if you see VU, that. or if you can see yeah. my cursor that's the original little stick that was grafted and then you can see that the the tissue grows around that over time so the affinity between the top and the bottom is something that's now being researched and we're really looking into it in relation to omega grafting uh, cleft grafting and the mechanization and industrialization of propagation so if we look at this picture can you see that one yeah so have a look on the left there's two Omega graphs. The one on the left has got a good vascular connection. You see that? Yeah, yeah. The one on the right doesn't. And why is that? So it could be to do with the vi it could be to do with virus, it could be to do with poor nursery practice, or a mismatch, like Jakob's hinting to Jakob is hinting to about the uh, the different scions with the rootstocks, but if we go, where's another picture? And this one here is those same, that same rootstock and scion, the picture on the left, this blue is the vascular tissue. On the right with a poor one, if it's poorly, been poorly managed in the nursery, it's got next to no vascular tissue. So it might grow wow. for a little bit or it might not. And this is green, this, is, this picture here is highlighting highlighting that same thing this is actually so kind of amazing i mean because like again like if you just are like tuning in and seeing this so this is basically like if anyone has any romantic notions about like wine or vines this is so amazing to see it's like looking at like a human like like it is like it feels like you see life like it's a really amazing way of um uh, like yeah, proving this, point this, these 3d images are amazing so this is where this is where i think there is some research in the omega shape oh, and okay, you can already see yeah, yeah in figure b there that image that there the is. conductive tissue doesn't go just straight up and down look at that wild that's pretty amazing so that's pretty cool that's a paper um, i'll put the i'll put the link up when we uh when we log off um wait so, so I def oh, um like on. we should uh, we should probably touch on a bit about like uh, like the disadvantages and challenges when it comes to like cost and we touch a little bit on loss of genetic diversity um but we should probably yeah, discuss that there 
I guess we've covered a couple of those. Um, the negatives, I guess one of the biggest negatives is cost, which is when you look at, um, when, <laughs> yeah, I found this today. When you look at what we are, where we are in Australia, I know it's backwards, but. Look at that. Okay. Isn't, <laughs> Phylloxera is not in SA, keep it that way, you know? Yeah. Here we are in South Australia without Phylloxera. And if you want a, uh, a new clone, that's grafted onto a rootstock, you might pay five, six, seven or more dollars per stick. Now you're gonna plant several thousand of those oh, no, per hectare yeah. Yeah. versus just walking out into the vineyard and taking a stick and getting it, getting a rooted cutting or buying a non-grafted cutting for 60 or 80 cents. There's a huge, huge difference in the cost, yeah, which people, um, it's, it's easy to ignore, but with phylloxera, it's not, I mean, I hope it's not in my lifetime, but it's not a matter of um, if it's when. Um, also, um, and Aaron had a couple of uh, questions, which is, yeah, so how old will the graft be before you know it's failing? Oh, well, that's something that Yako and I were talking about on the phone the other day that kind of prompted me to really think deeply about this is you can see a failed graft. Uh, you can see a failed graft straight away in the first year. Okay. But there's a high percentage that you can't see or you don't know that they're going to be failed grafts because they continue to grow. They might just be growing with some conductive tissue out the side. So they might only have 20%, 30%. They might have 80%, but they have a portion of the trunk that's never going to be a, uh, a perfectly formed trunk. Um, and then she also said, like, can you have speak? A the, have a look at oh, this. What's that? Uh, let me see if we're... Am I sharing this picture? No, but click onto it. You keep telling me that. Boo, boo, boo. Stop sharing this one. No, no. What do you mean? Okay. How's that? Nah, then you got to click onto nah, it. this computer's too slow. <laughs> It, it is. I've got to get my camera fixed on my other one, on my <laughs> computer. Um, um, you know, so Aaron was asking, yes, can you speak at all to the trend of grafting over to new varieties due to market demand? Um, so she's seen vines with multiple graft points, like a zigzag of like the varieties over some old roots. Yeah, totally. I've seen um, Franken vines myself where you've got a rootstock and then you've got two or, or three modifiers, wow. three different varieties or clones through there. It's, it's fashion. It goes back to the vine age thing. If you can get through with, um, if you can have a vineyard that can pay for itself, it'll live longer. If a vineyard isn't that great or if you're chasing fashion and you want to slip new buds in, you know, and you're going to do it multiple times, chances are you're not going to have a very long lived vineyard. It's literally, like it's literally fast fashion. Yeah, totally. I mean, you can change a variety, you can change a variety in a year, which I mean, there's valid reasons to do that. But when it comes to the longevity of the vineyard, um, you are at risk of reducing it a little bit. But I mean, you look at you look at some really old vines. Some really old vines I dealt with in Spain had multiple varieties, but they were but they were put in at the at the same time back here eighty odd years ago. Oh wow! Actually, we should talk a little bit about um, because we're running kind of low on time. Um, but the aging ability, like of grafted vines, um, oh, that's a, that's something that really that really interests me is how long i mean we've got own rooted vines that are 180 to 400 years old we know they live long because yeah. they are own rooted there's no major surgery or there's been no grafting but with grafted vines how old can they be when grafting was invented in the well, late 1800s i mean a lot of grafted vines are pulled out after 30 or 40 years yeah well I'm sure Sure, there's some some older. I mean, in, in Spain even, I've worked with um, vineyards that are 100 or more that were grafted. But the important point is, how were they grafted? Sure, they were grafted with attention in the field. They weren't grafted in a nursery. 
and planted out and they've and they've managed to persist for a, a long long time so i think there's a hint in that into how we're connecting the rootstock and scion for long-lived um vineyard plantings which we should consider now yeah we should do um and then just quickly like and like is there a correlation um in wine quality uh you both on the type of rootstock used or like like all the quality of the graft I think if you've got a poor quality graph, you've got a poor quality vine. So it's not going to grow well and it's yeah. going to be going backwards. Like that Petty Vidot I showed you at the very start. Yeah, that, I know. that was going, it was still producing, but it was going backwards. So yeah. um, it got pulled out. Um, but when it comes to these things that we've talked about, so the rootstock type, um, there's a massive influence on the type of rootstock and the quality. You put the wrong, you put the wrong rootstock in the wrong place. You know, if you put a rootstock that's a little bit thirsty or doesn't have the vigor to sustain it through to the end of summer in a dry situation, it's going to fall over. Yeah. So well, yeah, there's a mass there's a massive implication. I, I'm keen to hear okay. from people about if um, there is any interaction between vines. So if you've grafted vitis onto vitis like cabernet and put a pinot on top what sort of interactions you've seen there because we're still learning a lot about the interactions because it's a two-way street. The rootstock's yeah, yeah. talking to the vine and the vine's talking to the rootstock. And with molecular biology, we're learning more about messenger RNA and how these plants actually communicate. So it's um, it's a watch this space for sure. It's, it's such an in-depth sub your subject. So um, we'll, we'll probably have to like call it quits for now and we'll do another yep. part two next week um because again huge huge ideas like ex uh, brain expanding which is important it's, it's one of those it's one of those things gus as we start this and that's why at the start it was good that you said you know this is just a conversation between a couple of you know wine industry geeks because I get off of the computer and you know my phone goes off and I get the dms and I'm like yeah I should have covered this I should have covered that but I could talk for a day or more know, about these I subjects know. and you feel like, oh, we've just got this little, little, little segment. Little slither. Um, but but anyway. For me, the take home message would be that uh, rootstocks are not the variety, you know? So if you've got Shiraz on a rootstock, you're sensing and tasting that combination. So that's a question to ask people when you're talking about what variety you're growing, what rootstock are you growing? Um, yeah. They're not the enemy. Um, and they allow us to grow vines in unfavorable conditions. So the more we can learn from them, the better. Well, that's a really good way to end it. Um, well, thank you to everyone who kind of joined. Um, we'll see you again next Monday, the Monday, the 27th of April, um, which will be part two um, of rootstock and grafting. Like we'll kind of talk more about clone, like clone versus variety. Um, um, again, like you can follow the YouTube channel um, and we'll probably do Insta Live at the same time as well, just to help out. We can't always read like all the questions from there. Um, we'll do, we'll do that just thanks to, again. Just to I'm Gus us. Clark. <laughs> yes, we will. Um, yeah, so I'm Gus Clark, and you are I'm Dylan. Still Grigg. Dylan Grigg. And we'll see. You. Yeah, and we'll see you next week. And thank you so much for everyone joining. Okay, Cheers. let's end this one here. And let's